What's up, Make Pop Music? It's Austin here from Make Pop Music and Austin Hall Audio and Visual, and we are back with another video. This week, you guys voted on this video on our Instagram, so this one won out. So today, we are gonna be talking about 10 mixing mistakes that I think beginners should avoid. I think everybody should avoid these, but I think this is gonna be really imperative for beginners. I know a lot of the kind of beginner mixes that I get feedback on or that I hear or the mistakes that I was making as a beginner will be kind of addressed in this video. So hopefully, this will help you out. If you want, we are posting polls every couple weeks on what videos you guys wanna see, so go follow Follow us on Instagram at Make Pop Music. Other than that, if you like this video, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe because that all helps us out a ton. But without further ado, let's actually hop into the 10 things that I think you should be avoiding when you're mixing. So first off, the number one mistake that I see, especially in beginner mixes, is not getting good enough quality stems to actually mix. So this is whether they're being sent the stems as a mixing engineer or if this is a project that they've kind of recorded and engineered themselves. Uh, most of the time that I'm hearing beginner mixes, I've, I notice that there are fundamental issues in the actual stems and it's not even the mix it's fault so there are things like weird plosives that are all over all the vocals or there's this crazy buzzing in the guitar or everything was just tracked really far away or there are phase issues on mics and these are all things that no matter what you do in the mix you can kind of help a little bit but you'll never be able to fully get rid of so especially if you're a beginner trying to build your beginning portfolio and you're really trying to kind of you know make a good example and kind of put your best foot forward it is really really imperative that you work on songs that have really really well tracked stems or you're taking a little bit of extra time in that actual engineering process because it's so hard to fix it in the mix and we always say if the better you can get it at the source the better the mix is going to be my favorite mixes that i've ever done the stems came in super clean super organized they were super tight everything sounded amazing already coming in and so i was able to kind of focus on that mix rather than trying to make their vocal that was recorded on an iphone sound like it was recorded on a neumann so just keep that in mind when you're taking on mixes or when you're recording stuff yourself the better you can get it on the way in the better it's going to come out and if you're being hired for mixes don't be afraid to turn down projects because the stems come in and they're not really up to par i've had to turn down things in the past that i was really excited about the song but then once i got the mixes and started diving in um, the stems just really weren't there and i ended up having to turn it down because i knew that i wasn't going to be proud of the end result because no amount of any mixing that i could do would fix those issues that were there from the tracking Number two is kind of an expansion on that, and that is not having everything time aligned and tuned. So I hear this a lot specifically with vocals and specifically when there's gonna be a lot of layers of vocals. What separates this from the not getting good quality stems is I still want the stems clean, I want them tight, I want them recorded well, but if there are tuning discrepancies or there are small timing discrepancies, those are all things that can be fixed. If you're a mixing engineer, that's completely up to you if that's part of your package. I know some mixing engineers don't touch timing and editing, some do. Just have that conversation with the artist and with a client and make sure that they know. But either way, before you hop into the mix, whether you're taking care of the editing or whether they're taking care of the editing or a third party is, make sure that you have everything tuned and time aligned and it's gonna sit really well in the mix, especially if you're working on pop music, especially if there's not a lot of live organic elements. The more kind of live organic elements you have that will kind of have their own timing and they'll kind of have their own little pitch variations, you can start to get away with more kind of raw tracked vocals or more raw track guitars. But if you're having something that's super electronic where everything is perfectly on pitch, everything is perfectly time aligned to the grid, then those vocals are also gonna need to fit in there. Those guitars are also gonna need to fit in there. I see so many issues where people think that their vocal mix is not good and the actual mix sounds great. The EQing was fine. The compression was fine. They used enough reverb. The main issue was that the vocals are still just a little bit sloppy because nobody took the extra, you know, 20 minutes to an hour to go in and tune them and time align them. So sometimes there are going to be things that were tracked fine quality wise they came in okay you just have to put in that little bit of extra effort or they have to put in a little bit of that extra budget to actually get everything sitting in the right spot because once it's kind of glued in there and it's sitting in that pocket you'll find that it is a lot easier to mix things because they're not competing for timing issues and the third issue that i see happening a lot is more of a workflow issue and sometimes it can affect the final output but it normally just slows down mixers and that is not having your sessions organized so when i organize the session when i download stems i like to have everything color coded i like to have my full folders and my groups and my buzzes all set up. So before I even touch a level or I add an instance of EQ or compression, my mix is looking pretty. Everything is kind of going in order of how I prefer it. Um, you know, I've got all of my tracks from things that are going to come in first or at the top of the cues and I have these color coordinated codes. So 
really when I'm trying to navigate an entire mix, especially a dense mix that's gonna be 150 tracks and up, I'm able to immediately know, okay, I need a vocal. I know that my vocals are in dark purple and I know that I'm looking for a vocal that's two and a half minutes in. So I can just go to my, my purple vocal folder and I can look down and I can easily find where that bridge vocal is. So when you're working on mixes, especially if you're trying to perfect your workflow, take a little bit of extra time. It takes 10 or 20 minutes to set up a mix and make sure that if it works for you, you're color coding it, you're kind of putting everything in order of when they happen and you're layering your folders and your groups how you prefer. I know a lot of people will start with like drums, bass, vocals, synths, guitars, effects. I personally go drums, synths, guitars, bass, lead vocals, background vocals, effects, groups, and sins. I don't know why that's my workflow. It's just what makes the most sense in my head and it has sped me up an absolute ton. So take a little bit of extra time to actually organize your sessions. The fourth issue that I see happening a lot is people trying to make every single element way too big or way too grand. They want every element to shine. And especially when you're working with dense arrangements, that's just not gonna work. I see tons of times the mix is just overcrowded because the guitar is full spectrum, the drums are full spectrum, the vocals are full spectrum, there's bass happening everywhere, and then there's a bunch of synths filling that in. You have to think about a mix as a 3D space. You've only got a certain amount of width. You can only go to 100 left or 100 right without using something like a stereo imager that could cause phase issues. And then you've only got a certain amount of depth. So you have from silent until when it's gonna start clipping at zero dB. And you've got a little bit of depth from front to back where you can control that with things like EQ, reverb, delay, any kind of spatial effects. So when you're working on a mix, just know that you're gonna have to sacrifice certain frequencies or certain spatial elements of things to get everything sitting all together. You may have to take out a little bit of a, you know, kind of nice frequency in a guitar because it's just clashing with the vocals. So these are things that you just kind of have to learn. You have to learn where you're going to sacrifice things and what's worth cutting, what's worth keeping. But when you have dense arrangements, it's all about finding ways to gel things together. So instead of having every element kind of sound amazing and huge and big and grand, it really matters that everything is sitting really, really well together. So if that means cutting out a lot of frequencies on a vocal, that's just gonna have to happen for everything to sit well together. And that actually segues perfectly into our fifth point, which is stop soloing while you're EQing and compressing. So this is something that I see a lot of beginner people make. I made the same issue and I do it a lot on the channel just to kind of show you guys where I'm pulling from. But when you're actually working on a mix, try not to solo that much because when you're soloing things, that's gonna happen where you end up making every element sound too perfect or you're catering to that one element. And then once you pop it in the mix, you've taken out something with EQ or you've kind of added a compressor at a weird setting that sounded cool for that one stem, but it's just not really working in the context of the song. So what I like to do when I'm mixing is basically get my levels and then I'll go on with EQ and kind of make sure everything is sonically fitting in. And then I'll go in with compression and make sure everything is kind of glued together. My drums are punchy, my vocals are tight. And uh, typically I try not to solo that much unless I'm looking for a very, very, very specific frequency that I can hear buzzing out, I might just swap to a solo for one quick second just to make sure that I can kind of notch that out and then I'll pop it back in the mix and I'll adjust it from there. But soloing too much while you're EQing or while you're compressing or while you're adding any kind of spatial effects is really gonna kind of lead you down the wrong path and you'll probably spend a ton of time chasing the wrong dragon. The sixth thing that I see is kind of an extension of the last two and that is over mixing everything. It's a little bit different than just soloing and it's a little bit different than mixing everything to be too big. I just find over mixing is when people just kind of throw the kitchen sink at something. So, you know, a lot of the times when I'm getting stems for a track that I'm gonna mix, I ask that the artists send the stems kind of as is in their demo mix and then I ask that they send them raw and clean just in case because more times than not, there will be at least a couple tracks that sound really, really funky. And even when I'm trying to mix it in the final mix, I'm having issues. So a lot of the time I'll have to go to that raw track that has nothing on it and I can kind of start from there. And I have their track to kind of see what they were going for. Um, but a lot of the time people are just throwing way too much, especially on things like vocals, on things like drum samples. Typically, you're not gonna have to do too, too much as long as it was tracked really well or you're using a good sample or a good plugin. So I'm seeing people, you know, take electronic samples and add tons of compression and tons of saturation and tons of EQ, not realizing that those things have already kind of been added in once that sample was made. So it's one thing to, you know, download a kick drum sample and then EQ it a little bit so it fits in your mix. It's another to download a kick drum sample that was crazy processed and then go through, you know, six or seven inserts on your chain. A lot of the time you're just gonna over mix things and it's just gonna completely step on them and start ruining the fidelity. 
So just remember when you're taking that mixing approach, always start as simple as possible. Again, I like to just start with gain and level and then I'll do some EQ and then some compression and then some reverb and spatial effects. And then if I need anything, that's where I'll go in with the extra tools like saturation, multiband compression, any kind of extra stuff like that. So I try not to start throwing on those things unless they're more corrective issues or they're just gonna add a certain sauce once I have the mix kind of generally gelling together. If you're finding yourself relying too much on those specialty plugins, a lot of the time it's because you're not really doing what you need to do earlier in your mix. The seventh mistake that I see happen all the time is people don't know their plugins and this typically is the reason that people are over mixing or that they are just adding way too much or that they're trying to make everything sound too perfect is because they didn't take the time to actually learn plugins when they purchased them or when they downloaded them. Um, they don't know what all the settings are. They don't know what they're supposed to be looking for. So what I do when I purchase any plugin or any kind of new effect or anything like that is I'll typically take about an hour to you know just look over the manual, watch a couple of tutorials where people run through that specific plugin and then I'll start to try to use it on something that is not going to be like a final mix it's really just kind of an experiment for me to find out how that works so learning how your EQs work learning how your compressors work learning how your reverbs work learning the actual fundamentals behind all of these things that you just see everybody doing especially on YouTube or in courses is going to be huge for actually being able to take information that you're hearing and associate that with a workflow that's really going to work for you because normally I just see people a lot of the time adding compression because they feel like they need to or they're adding EQ because they feel like they've seen other people do it but they don't really have that game plan so when you're mixing the more that you know your tools the more you can go in with a game plan and so when I start working on a mix, typically I can hear the final mix in my head. And since I know my tools, it only takes me a couple hours to actually get to that point. So unless there's just some miscommunication with the artist in me, uh, typically if they send good quality stems and I kind of have a good vision in mind, I'll nail it pretty much right off the back. And then we go through small revisions from there because I know my tools and I know my workflow. So take a little bit of extra time. You spend a lot of money on plugins. You spend a lot of time in them. It, it's definitely worth it to invest a little bit of time up front and just make sure that you learn them inside and out because it will speed up your workflow. It'll make sure you're not over mixing everything and it'll just clean up your entire process. The eighth thing I see happening with beginner mixes, and this was one of the biggest things for me, is just following rules way too much. And especially now that we have YouTube tutorials and then we have online groups where everybody is giving their opinion on, you know, minus 14 LUFS, or you need to be getting, you know, negative six on gain reduction when you're doing this. Those are all very arbitrary numbers and nothing really is like an industry standard. The only time you need to worry about that specifically is if you're turning in final mixes or final masters. But other than that, you just wanna make sure things aren't clipping and then it's all about just finding things that sound good to you. So if you need to take 14 dB out of 500 on a kick drum, then do it. Even if somebody on Facebook said not to do it, it doesn't matter. If that's what needs to be done, you should know how to service your actual mix. You should know how to actually service the song at hand so just be weary when you're seeing these graphs go around on instagram or when you're seeing these little infographics or even when you're getting tips and tricks off of this channel these should all just be general guidelines or maybe inspiration to try different methods or different techniques but never take anything as gospel never make sure that you're following somebody's you know actual workflow down to a t or you're following a chain that you've seen because it's almost never going to work out perfectly for you instead you need to be able to kind of take in that information kind of analyze it pull things that you like from it be like oh that's a cool tip or maybe i'll try that little trick in my mix because once you can do that, that's how you start getting these nice little nuggets of information online and you stop ruining your mix just from arbitrary people that haven't even heard your song. The ninth issue that I see happening with beginner mixes is mixing too much to a reference. So I'm all about reference mixes. I don't use them a ton, but I definitely like to reference them. But typically when I'm asking an artist for a reference or when I'm referencing, I'm going in with a very specific approach. So if I'm working on a song that was inspired by another one, I'll kind of see, you know, do y'all like that vocal sound? Do y'all like that drum sound? Do y'all like that guitar sound? sound? Do you like how wide those synths are? Do you like how narrow everything is? And I'll start to write down really specific things. So when I'm working on our mix, I can still focus on my song at hand that I'm working on, but I'm able to kind of take those extra little elements and make sure that the inspiration is kind of there. And it just speeds up a little bit of that guessing game, but I am almost never, ever, ever just turning on an extra mix and just making sure that my kick drum is sitting the exact same as theirs or my bass is in the exact same frequency range or that my vocal has the exact same amount of reverb because they're different songs. They were made by different artists. They're probably in different tempos and keys. And a lot of the time you're just gonna find this really, really, really big dissonance when you're over-referencing and you're gonna be doing things to kind of fit the reference and not fit your song. So I'm all for referencing to make sure that you're not overloading your low end or to make sure that your vocal's kind of sitting similar to where you like in a reference mix, but just make sure when you're referencing, you're not taking that reference mix as gospel and you're not just doing 
everything that you can to match that exactly because it's just it's normally not going to work unless you have a song that is just super similar and you got really 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 lucky so be wary when referencing it's one thing to reference final master levels it's one thing to kind of reference overall dynamics but make sure that you're not just going out and soloing everything and just making sure that everything is coming together perfectly to that reference because then once you flip yours back on at the end you're probably not going to love where everything's sitting because you didn't have your actual song at hand remember mixing is an art form it's also a science but it needs to come from the heart as much as it's coming from the mind and as much as it's coming from the ears so sometimes the perfect mix the perfect reference mix is not going to be perfect for your song because it just doesn't have that extra sauce that your song needed all right and the 10th thing that i see happening with beginner mixes and this is another big one for me it's just getting way too many outside opinions so i am huge on getting my opinion of course getting the artist's opinion that I'm working for. But then outside of that, I have a group of peers, maybe four or five people, that if I'm having trouble with something or if I need to just get some extra ears, I'll send it to them. It's people that I trust, it's people that I know, it's people that I respect. So just be weary. I see a lot of the time, we run a Facebook group, so a lot of the time we're seeing people post their demo mixes and then the comments are just filled with contradicting information. If someone's telling them to turn a vocal up, someone's telling them to turn a vocal down, somebody's saying that the mix is awful, somebody's saying that the mix is great, and that's typically gonna happen when you're putting that out to a group of people that are A, listening for issues, and they're not just listening as a casual listener, and B, they're listening to try to put their own stamp on it. So when you're looking to get some outside ears, I definitely recommend just actually networking with people, making friends, making mentors, making peers. And then once you've kind of built those relationships with people that you trust, people that you admire, or people whose work you actually kind of aspire to, to sound like, then you can start sending your mixes to them and actually getting their opinion because they'll probably lead you on a lot better path rather than 40 people on a Facebook thread. I mean, you can scroll down any of our videos on YouTube and you're gonna find comments contradicting exactly what I'm saying or comments agreeing with with exactly what I'm saying. So just remember that everything is so personal. If you're just putting your stuff out there for literally anybody to put their opinion on, a lot of the time, it's not gonna be what you actually need. It's not gonna be what the song actually needs. So just make sure that you have a group of peers that you actually trust, that you think that their information is really, really solid, and that you think will actually help you go down the right path for your mix at hand. So those are 10 things that I see most beginners making. I see a lot of intermediate and advanced people making the mistakes too. I mean, hell, I am guilty of, of making those mistakes quite a bit still, but I just think that there are things that you should be looking out for because they can easily derail a mix. So again, it's just all fundamental. Start with really good quality tracks, try not to do too much at the start and really serve the song, and then make sure that you're not getting overwhelmed by references or by outside opinions or by generic advice that you just find on the internet. So hopefully this helps. Hopefully these are things that you can start watching out for in your mix and you're gonna find that A, they speed up your workflow, but B, they're gonna give you a mix that you feel serves the song better and that you feel more proud of. If you like this video, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. That helps us out a ton. If you want to share the video, that also helps us. If you want to head over to our website, makepopmusic.com, we have samples, courses, presets, all kind of cool stuff like that that you can help support the channel. Other than that, just follow us on all of our socials that are linked in the description, and we will see you guys next time. Much love, everyone. Peace out. Will you come around and save me? Be my silver lining, baby.